Hey, welcome. It's Captain Matt, Voter Secret Weapon. I want to thank you for joining us for this uh, Sunday Night Live. Uh, we're getting ready to start here in just a couple of minutes here. Uh, we'll start about 8.30, but I wanted to welcome you. If you've never been to the to a uh, live, here's what you can expect. Just go ahead and, and chat in your uh, comment section, on whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on YouTube. Just ask your question, leave your comment there. And then as we go through the time, I just kind of scroll down all the comments and I try to answer them. Now, if it's something that I need to ask you a question, I may ask you a question and just put it in the chat again and uh, I'll come back and, and I'll get that information so I can give you a more personalized uh, response, something that's going to really add value for you. This is just something I do. One, it, it, it's great fun. I really enjoy it. It's helpful for the community. Just sharing my knowledge. Now, one thing that you need to know, I don't know everything about boats. I know a lot about boats. I've been, uh, been a boater since I was five. I've sold boats. Um, it's, it's something that is my, a big, big part of my life. With that said, I don't know everything. Matter of fact, sailboats have zero experience with sailboats. Bass boats, very little experience there. Bow riders, deck boats, center consoles, jet boats, twin engines, stern drives, outboards, inboards, all of that I have experience with. And if I have an answer, I'll give you my best answer. If I don't have an answer, I'll try to give you a resource that will be valuable for you. If I have an opinion, I'll try to give you that opinion, but let you know, this is what I think, not what I absolutely know. So I look forward to it. Here's a little video intro that a subscriber made for me. Thanks, Bo. And uh, we'll see you on the live when it kicks off here in just a moment. Welcome, 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 everybody. It's Captain Matt, Boater's Secret Weapon. And uh, added that little little commercial. I keep forgetting to do the commercial, so I figured I would add it so I, I would stop forgetting to do that. Um, but anyway, welcome, everybody. Great to have so many folks on uh, bright and early. I, um, I just drove back from Canaan, West Virginia. Brian was up that was up that way, did some uh, tubing with my in-laws and my kids had a great time, but I was on the road for seven hours on the way back. My, my littlest, um, my youngest got sick on the way home. So she is, hopefully she is, uh, going to wake up feeling good, but we had to make a few extra stops to unload some baggies of, of yuck. So anyway, we are back looking for a good live. I uh, already saw some questions come in, so we will uh, we will jump on that. Um, Jason got the chaparral, and um, so congratulations, Jason. We'll get you get to your question here. Um, saw a couple others come in. Uh, great to have everybody. Uh, 211, thank you for that. Always appreciate it. Eric, good to have you here. Silver Stranger, always great to have you. Yeah, I, I thought that was pretty close to you. We were we stayed in Davis, some little tiny town, but we we went to um oh I don't even know what mountain it was um but uh, one of the one of the tubing hills and uh, went up to Thomas to uh, there's a burrito place up there that was real good uh, Hellcat something like that Hellraiser burrito a little Mexican or a, I'm sorry a um, Italian place that was pretty good so. Um, Kelly, we'll, we'll get to your question here as well. Um, so let's start off the first question that we had, uh, the, the difference between the, the get up and go of the, of the 250 versus the, the 300. First of all, you'll, you're more likely to have the Bravo three drive. If we're talking, uh, if we're talking the Mercruiser, 
uh, you'll more likely have the Bravo three on the 300, which means that that's also going to give you more whole shot, more out of the out of the uh, whole torque with the load um, than the 250. But it's it's really hard for me. I haven't figured out a good way to describe this for folks yet. Um, but it's it's noticeable. Um, you put you put that same load like we had when I was selling. We had a, a 240 sun deck that we could either put the the 5.0 at the time this was before they went to cast in their own blocks uh, the 5.0 was 260 horsepower uh the 350 mag was 300 horsepower you could put either one in we usually put the 5.0 um fuel injected which was 260 horsepower but when you got and you ran and it, it, it was adequate for that boat it ran it great for you know six people the way most pleasure boaters do but when you put that 350 in and you were under load it was a noticeable difference but we also with that matched it up with the bravo 3 on the on the 50 fuel injected you may or may not go bravo 3 um but with the 300 you definitely would so that combination was significantly better whole shot and power uh, is, is the right way for me to describe it. And, and again, it's one of those things where you really have to feel that. Um, uh, but, but the best thing I can say is it was noticeable to me, um, when you're, when you're on that bigger boat and that was a 22 foot. So that, that 220 sun deck was a true 22 feet, eight and a half foot beam, the 240 sun deck, um, almost always went with the 300. Uh, and it was a, it was a better setup for that, a true, it was 24 foot, one inch, eight and a half beam on that. And again, the Bravo three drive as well. Um, so I would say when you start to get to that 22, 24 is where you're going to probably have to make that decision, uh, on most boats. And if you're, if you're going to put some weight on it, um, I'll, I'll say you'd be, it'll be noticeable difference and you'll probably be happier your resale will also be easier, higher uh, as well. I think there's probably a $2,500 price difference between, um, between the two. And again, uh, you mentioned not top speed. You'll get a little bit more top speed. But again, when you go from the Alpha to the Bravo, the Bravo 3, you've got more drag. So you lose, let's say you lose you lose some top end it, it, because you have those extra, extra propellers and extra drag. Um, but yeah, the horsepower and you only, so you only pick up a little bit, not as much as you might expect. So hopefully that, uh, hopefully that makes sense for you. Matt, I'm glad you get so excited about these lives. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, all right. Yes. It, it the, the new, the new Mercs are V10s, the 350 and 400. Um, uh, Mercury outboard. So I was um, sustainability. I At the Charlotte Boat Show, I haven't put this video together yet, but I interviewed the Merc guys that were there. They didn't have the 600, but they had the 350 and the 400, um, the new ones. Uh, on the Verados and they're, they're both V tens. Um, and they are, let's see. I'm trying to pick one. That's going to give me, I'm going to go with this one. Although I don't know if it's going to give me what I'm looking for. Um, but you can see they're, they're V tens. Um, what he was, what he was talking me through was on the Verados, um, it's this midsection that they're really getting that quietness. On the Verados, they're focusing on the power and the quiet. This is what they're putting on the pontoons. Um, the Pro XS is what they're putting on. And he he talked about it this way in terms of the sound, the people that want the sound. So the bass boat guys, uh, they, they like that two-stroke sound. So they've tuned that Pro XS to run at a higher RPM and have a little bit different sound. Everything about the Verado um, and these new V10s as well is quiet, smooth, effortless. And that has to do with a lot of what they do in the midsection here that's covered up. That video will be coming out. Um, 
that video will be coming out in the next week or two. I just need to get it put together. So, um, but yeah, those are, those are V10s. They're monster engines. They're real big. And, um, and I'll, I let the, they also, they're all digital as well. So yeah, they, they will be able to upgrade to the joystick control. If you, you know, because they're digital throttle and steering, once you go to that digital steering and I don't know if, Yeah, they're, they're not showing it, but it looks similar to the hydraulic or the power steering, um, but there's no fluid. It's all it's all digital. It's all electrical impulses, the fly by wire like we've been doing with the shifters for decade, you know, probably 15 years or more. But the let's see. Yeah, you can't see it on that either. Um, but the digital steering, once you are are turning not by pushing fluid one way or another, but by electrical impulses, now you can do the joystick. Now you can do the autonomous docking. Um, you can do some really, uh, autopilot kind of stuff, um, with that technology. So that is, is something he was talking a lot about, um, on, uh, on those new, those new V10 Verados, the 350 and the 400. Um, now, when you, they are, they're no longer making it, but, uh, what were they calling that? 350 four stroke Mercury. There is, let me go to this channel. Um, family Marine Rado comparison. All right. So this is, um, Tom from family Marine. He's a, he's a dealer up in Minneapolis, but, um, um, and, um, him and do a, do a great job. He has put out some good educational videos. And then this one, um, he talks about when they came out, They've got the 300, the 350, and the 400, and he he talks through it. Yes, as a dealer, yes, trying to sell you something, but he's very good about educating. So um, sustainability, you might want to check out Tom's video uh, because it's it's real good. They sell the Barlettas up there, um, and they've I think they've got another another brand as well. Um, looks like maybe Premier and Sweetwater. Um, but he talks through the difference between and how they order boats. Here's the one thing you get when you talk to a dealership owner is they have the opportunity to go to dealer meetings um, and they get to run the same platforms with the different engine setups because they're trying to, the manufacturer is trying to sell orders and trying to get them to, you know, push them whatever direction they're trying to take the the brand and um, wherever, you know, however they're buying the engines at the manufacturer level and they're letting the dealers run these so they can say, hey, look, this runs just fine with the 350 or this is the Mercury new 400 and it's so much superior that we really want you to go with this. Go out and run the two boats um, and now you can have your decision and they, they get all the technical details. And because they buy 50, 100, 200 boats, like they're they're putting a lot more thought into it um, than, you know, than you, you may realize. And, um, you know, they're, they're really trying to make a smart decision based on cost and power. Like I said, with our 20, 220 sun deck and the 240 sun deck, how our owner decided what we ordered for inventory was what I think is the best bang for the buck. If you want to upgrade, or if we think the, that the power that they offer a standard is too low, then we will never order that and we'll only order the upgraded because it won't perform. And we know that's going to cause customer service issues. So those kinds of conversations are dealers are, are having all the time with their sales staff, with their internal people, or just, you know, with their, with their business partners. Um, all right, let's see. Question Bimini on wakeboard tower connection is shaving. Is this normal? Yeah. Is it, it Here's Jason, and I, I sent that email to you about the couple other questions that you have. I realize that you just bought a brand new boat, and you're used to buying a you know a brand new Tahoe or a you know a, a Denali or something like that, and it being absolutely perfect. 
because boats are very much handmade, there are a lot of times little things that would never fly in the auto industry, but are pretty normal, unfortunately, in the boating world. And one of those things is to have anywhere where they're drilling in is to have those shavings not get cleaned up. They are not going through a boat with a vacuum and sucking up metal shavings, wood shavings, fiberglass shavings, whatever kind of boat you have. Um, it's really common in pontoons. They run through and they tap something into a bracing um, and, and you open up the compartment and there's you know, a pile of, of metal shavings. It's the same thing on that, uh, on that Bimini is that they're very likely as somewhere where they, they, uh, what would you call it? Um, where they did something to that Bimini and the metal shavings are, are kind of falling out from somewhere. If you want, Jason, take a picture of it or a video and show me exactly what it is. But that's my guess, um, is, is it's it's shavings that came from from when they uh, machine that piece at some part of the production process, and now those shavings are coming out. I, I would I would be surprised if it's creating new shavings. If it is, that's something that we need to that we need to look at, figure out why is it happening, um, and, and you know, do we need to adjust something? So send me a picture or a video, and I'd be happy to look at that for you. But my gut tells me. It's shavings from when it was machined at the factory, and now they're they're kind of they're coming out somewhere, um, and they're just because they're loose shavings. That would be that would be my guess. And again, it's it, because the because the boating market is so small, and yet yeah, they build a thousand, you know, maybe probably five hundred, seven hundred um, of those uh, twenty one. 23 SSIs that they, they don't have the automation. They don't have the, um, attention to detail. They don't have the, you know, cleaning up all of that stuff before the boat gets to the, to the dealer. And sometimes the dealer, well, well I'll say most of the time, the dealer isn't going to clean that stuff up either. Um, it just, just doesn't happen. Uh, and, and it's, it's unfortunate, but, but is, that is no, normal. Um, for the industry a uh, big fan of the shimano reels cash and rods bass fishing never really fish walleye um mad cats rods they seem to be well built too awesome thank you for sharing that brock brian let's see here <laughs> um smash that like button thank you guys Eric, Brian. All right, Kelly, we're back to you. I've got a 2005 Mercury 200 horsepower, went into guardian mode. Um, any insights on this problem? Uh, Kelly, it, it can go into guardian mode for a number of reasons. Um, one, overheating, low oil or, or low fluid of some sort, uh, any sensors. In 2005, ba, 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 tell, me, tell me what... Um, a 200. So that's probably the 200, 200 four stroke, um, guardian 200 horsepower mercury. Stroke. Um, you can 2005, you should be able to hook that up to a, um, to a, a, code reader, a, a computer. They just plug it into one of the little, um, uh, female ends under the cowling. But if you look, they there's, if you got an alarm sound, you can figure out what that is. Four beeps every two minutes is water and fuel. It's not going to go into limp mode for that. Uh, but your guardian codes are there. And then, um, Let's see, low oil pressure, uh, but those are all horns, um, intermittent beeping, fuel pump, battery relay, uh, ECM issues. So this will tell you, oh, crap, <laughs> here I am thinking that you guys could see this. I need to get better about my, my screen management. But, um, but if, you just, if you just search for 
2005, whatever model you have guardian codes and, and Mercury is, they're pretty much all going to be the same. Um, but overheating could be a, could be a big one. Something with an ended into limp mode. Um, and what it's doing is it's really just keeping you at low RPM. So you don't cause any additional damage. So go through the codes, think back. Did I hear a audible alarm when it was going off? And that will help you zero in. Um, three beeps narrows it down to this group, uh, intermittent beeps narrows it down to this continuous beeps, um, or continuous beep will give you, um, these right there. And, um, and again, if, if you didn't get an audible alarm, go, go to a, go to a tech, a mercury tech, they can plug it into their computer and they can pull out a, a list of codes that the engine has thrown what the circumstances, so what the RPM, what was happening with the boat when that code was thrown. So maybe it's something that was, you know, some, you did something weird at the helm or the motor did something, something unusual because it had water in the fuel, but it's all right. That's, that's an easy fix and we're fine. And it might, might not take much of anything. You sucked up a plastic bag that you were unaware of. Uh, and that, you know, sucked up on the intakes and that caused it to start overheating, went into limp mode. You slowed down, that bag fell off and, and now you're fine. Or it could be something, something more serious. Like that ECM one is, is one that is, I'd say common, uh, but that can get you and could be a, can be one that you got to go to the, you got to go to the codes on the computer and they can pull that up. So, and any, any mercury tech, um, will, will likely have that software. If they're a serious mechanic, doesn't have to necessarily be a dealer. It can be a, it can be a mobile tech, uh, in your area and they can help you out. We did. <laughs> I, um, we ate at, uh, Sirianni's. We ate at, um, hell, hellbender, hellbender burritos. Uh, and we went to, then we went up the way to the purple fiddle and lit some bluegrass and had, uh, uh, had a few drinks and hung out there, kind of walked around the town on Saturday when it was all, all rainy. We did tubing on Friday, uh, which was, was kind of good, but yeah, um, the Sirianni's was, was great. So, um, all right, let's go back to here. Uh, bass fishing will be trolling spin cast. Uh, Bo, good to have you. Welcome. Chris M can bottom paint remove, removed and bottom restored to its original gel coat. Yes, it can. Um, it is a lot of work, a lot, a lot of work. So when they, and I've, my, my old general manager did it on, he bought an old Boston Whaler 13 sport, like a 70 something had the original teak, uh, and it was bottom painted on a, a old trailer. Um, and he took that off, but here's what you got to do. You've got to sand it down back to the gel coat. And now then you've got to either re-gel coat it or repaint it a, a white, something that's going to look better. It's why when you bottom paint a boat that doesn't traditionally stay in the water, it really, really, really hits the, um, it really hits the resale value is because you're, once you bottom paint it, you're almost always going to have that bottom paint. You know, it's so, it's so much manual work because there's only one way to get that off. Um, and you either, you either got to sandblast it, you got to manually sand it. Um, and it takes some serious, serious, serious work. Um, and if somebody's not, if they don't know what they're doing, you can damage the good gel coat. Uh, you can go too deep and you can cause, you can cause other issues. So it's, it's a lot, a lot of work. Um, and, uh, th that's why it, it drops the resale value so much. It's why I encourage people not to bottom paint a boat to get a, you're better off buying, investing in a lift because I, I told my buddy this. So my buddy bought, um, a, a Chaparral, what, 24, um, a, a 24 Chaparral. Uh, I think it was an SSX. Bought the boat, had it in a dry storage. They've run it for two years. They loved it. They enjoyed the the lake so much that they bought a condo up on Lake Norman. 
and it has a slip. So they bought a slip with it as well. And he said, Hey, I don't want to get a lift. They're, they're 12 grand, 15 grand for a lift. Um, you know, can I just leave this in the water bottom painted? He's from the coast. So this is common to him. And they, they left their big boat in the water, uh, in Wrightsville beach. He's like, can I just bottom paint it, leave it in the water? I was like, James, listen, first of all, it's going to cost you two grand to bottom paint it. You got to do that every two to three years. Um, and then it's going to drop, you know, your, your boat's worth, let's say 25 grand, you bottom paint it. And now your boat's worth 20 because it goes down and you're never going to sell it right after you get the bottom paint redone and it's looking great. You're going to have to redo the bottom paint to get it looking great. So that's another two grand. Um, or you can buy a $12,000 lift. You can use it for as long as you want. Your boat's in better shape. You don't have to worry about it sinking. Um, and when you go to sell it, you're going to get top dollar for it. If you take good care of it, like he does. Um, and then you sell the lift and at worst you can sell it for 50%, but probably 75% because used lifts go like hotcakes. So when you, when you do the math, it's cheaper to get the lift. If you have ability to do that, where you store the boat and you get to resell the boat for higher dollar, um, and it looks better, um, all the way around. So that's, that was my recommendation in a similar situation. Um, if that's, if that's why you're asking, if you're looking at buying one, that's got bottom paint, Move, move to the next one probably because it probably has issues from leaving it in the water, uh, especially if it's a, if it's a stern drive, um, it was left in the water and it's going to have some deferred maintenance likely. Um, Corey, good to have you. My F two fifty is a V10. Um, is it really? What year is Silver Stranger? What year is yours? Um, F250. Oh, that's Mercury. That's a Yamaha. Unless you're talking F-250 truck. All right. That may be what you're saying. All right. Uh, man, I just can't catch a break with the Bayliner. Now my stern drive has a warp shaft. Love this boat and all, but it can only take so much. Is it SE drive? I... I and I've, I've talked about this bow in, in a video before. Um, and, and I, I've had, I've had several people say they've had outstanding experience with the SEI drive. My experience has been that the, they are not as well built as the OEM, um, alpha, the SEI drives. There's a, there's a reason they're cheaper. Like, there's, I had a guy say when I, I did a pontoon video, the best and worst pontoons, he said, all, all you did is take the most expensive pontoons and say, those are the best. Like, yeah, that's how things work. If it's, if it's cheaper, there's a reason why it's cheaper. They're not making less money. They're not, they don't have some, they don't have some secret way that they can build boats cheaper than others. There is some scale to a point, but yeah, if you if you can sell a boat for five thousand dollars or a motor for a thousand dollars less than the competition, that's because that's because you took out seven hundred dollars of cost somewhere. Like that's just the way that's just the way manufacturing businesses work. And so the SEI drives, in my opinion, is they're not as they're not as good as the Alpha Drive. Um, the OEM alpha drive is going to be a better experience. You're less likely to have issues. Does that mean that your SEI drive is going to have issues? No, not necessarily, but they're more likely to. So it, it's a, it, it, are you willing to take that chance to spend $2,500 versus spending $3,500 or whatever the price point is right now? Um, and, uh, you know, but again, 
Bo, with where you are and with your your contacts that you're building in the industry, um, you know, maybe you can find a, a a rebuilt alpha drive. Maybe you can find a an alpha drive that's on a salvage boat that the boat's totaled, uh, but the drive's fine. There's 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 several ways to do it. And because you have the connections in the industry or you're building those connections, you know what questions to ask. You could probably do the work yourself. You could go pull it um, and you could you could put it on, install it on your Bayliner. Um, that, that could be an option to get the OEM equipment at a, a discounted price because of your knowledge, your experience and your um, your connections. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Labor cost, Jerry. You're exactly right. Um, I, I, hey, do you have, I, I'm curious if you've got your Regal, um, if your Regal is painted or not. I, I think you leave yours in the water. I don't know if you have a lift or not. I don't remember if we've talked about that. Um, all right. April 6th is the day I did. I did my little quiz on the channel the other day and, um, let's see where everybody came out. I think, uh, yeah, April, April seemed to be the day that when you plan on your first boat outing, um, about 20% are on the water now, 15% in March, 44% in April, and then, uh, a small group by Memorial day. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to hit the water. I got a bunch of filming to do and, um, I'm just waiting for the water to warm up and to get everything organized. Um, The active exhaust. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's what he was talking about. That the the Pro XS. He he didn't even talk about the extra torque and the the higher RPMs. He all he would talk about. What well, this is just him and I shooting the shit. But um, he kept going back to the sound. He's like, and the the Pro XS is all about the sound. Like the those guys want the sound. They got to have that uh, two stroke sound. So. Um, yeah, Silver Stranger. I I find it very funny that um, I, I've got my video, and I think Bo even uh, made this comment when he first joined the channel. Um, was uh, the clickbaity headline that I used was "Bayliner suck?" Question mark. And my answer was, "No, they're a great boat for a lot of people. If you take care of them, they don't give you the ride. They don't have the fit and finish. They don't have the quality of construction." that you get with the boat that, you know, costs 15, 20 grand more. But it, again, that's how they get that price point is because they don't do that, but it's a nice, safe, reliable boat. It's got the same engine that, a that a Sea Ray has in it. It's got the same engine that they put on a Boston Whaler. You know, that's 50% of the, of the cost of it about on a new boat. And <laughs> it's the same exact thing. You know, it's the most important piece does the boat run? Does it start up? And, and that's exactly the same. So it's all the other stuff that, uh, um, that where they bring the, bring the price down. Um, <laughs> it, and again, I, I talked about on the, on the, on the bay liners as well. And this is on any entry level boat, any boat that a first time boat owner has, has, owned and used is they make some mistakes. They do some things with it that they just don't know any better. It's why we created the, the boater boot camp for free is because I wanted to expose new boaters to things that could really cause problems with their boating lifestyle. You know, things that they don't even, they don't know. They just, they don't have any idea what the fuel water separator, why that's so important, why running straight gasoline is important, why you don't start the boat out of the water. Um, you know, why you don't run in shallow water. And, you know, I talked about sucking up a bag and overheating to throw that code. Um, I, I talk about that in the boot camp because that happens, you know, it, it's going to happen to everybody at some point in a two or three year boating career. You suck up a plastic bag or you suck up some seaweed and you start overheating. And if you don't even know what to look for, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. But, um, um, that that can happen. And because a lot of Bayliner owners are, that's their first dip into the boating world. Some of those boats have those issues, not because they're poorly made, but because the owner, previous owner 
didn't know exactly how to how to maintain and, and properly care for a boat. Um, so you mentioned the Bravo um, comes from the IO. Would you say 23, 24 foot pontoon, um, 200 versus 250? It, yeah, it, it's when you get to when you get to that level, and if we're if we're talking uh, Mercury. 200 horsepower versus 250 horsepower. It's it's going to be the same type of thing. And when you go to, when you jump from the 200 to the 250 um, on the on the Mercury's, if you're in Mercury, and this is Fishing Monthly Magazine. I just I just chose this video. Um, Oh, these guys are. I was hoping they would have. No, that's not going to have. So that that video, it'll it's going to tell me what I want. Let me see if this one is is going to be better. I'm looking for a chart. All right, they're comparing the 200. But you you go to displacement. When you're when you go from the V6 to the V8, um you you gain that torque. You you gain the top end, but you also you gain that out of the hole with weight on the boat with that. And so the yes, you will you also you'll feel a difference going from a 200 to a 250 um on the Mercury because you're, I believe that you are getting a different engine depending on which 200 and 250 you're talking about, but you're getting a, a, let me see here. I might, this is, this is why my videos are so ugly is because my mind thinks in terms of, my mind thinks in terms of, um, visual like this talking over a beautiful picture i don't get it as much but okay so no they're not i take that back the 200 no this isn't the this isn't what i was looking for either oh i didn't break it down either i don't think mercury 200 horsepower Verse 250 horsepower stroke. I don't want video. Yeah, there we go. This is what I'm looking for. I want to see. I don't remember off the top of my head where 200. 300. Uh, specs. Can you not just give me... Here we go. All right, so 4.6 liter V8. That's on the Pro XS. You're probably the 250. If you're the Verado, is the V8. So yeah, you. It's going to be it, it, what you what you want to look for is that displacement in the cylinders. And when you go from like some the the 150, 175, and 200 are the same block. They're just tuning it different to get those higher horsepowers. When you take that jump that's when you get a bigger performance increase, if that makes sense, Matt, um, because you've got, you truly have more power. You're not just tuning it to, to bring the more power out of it. The engine's giving you more. Um, and I'm not a, I'm not a tech guy, so I'm not using the right words, um, but it's, it's delivering more power just naturally. 
And, um, and so it's not having to work as hard to get that. It's got more because it's got more in the tank. It gets you more right from the start. I, I think that, uh, that's probably the best way for, for me to explain it. Um, and if, so if you're talking about the, the Mercury side of things on Yamaha, I think it's the same. I think they are, they break at 250 as they go to the, the, um, from the 200 to the 250 is a, is a different engine block. And, and that's what you want to look at. So I, I probably should do, I probably should do a deep dive on the horsepower, like the specific horsepower differences versus all of the motors. It's a lot though. Cause if you look, you've got the Verado, you've got the pro XS, um, and you've got the four stroke, the, just the regular Mercury four stroke. And the same thing with Yamaha, you've got the, um, the, the standard Yamaha, and then you got the, uh, XTOs, um, and the, sh and the shows as well. And, and they're, they're different. <laughs> Big ladder to the end. Hey, you, if you love it, you love it. Stick with it. Um, took out my brand new 20 for the first time. Didn't start first time out. I know your pain. Um, yeah, I remember getting that. Remember getting that email from you, Silver Stranger. Medium heavy power. All right. Awesome, Brock. Thank you for 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 adding in in the uh, in the comments. Um, I'm interested to hear what Captain Matt has to say on this. Just had my bottom repainted. Okay, out drive being done this week. All right. So, Jerry, let me know if there was if there was something else that um, I, I think I covered it pretty good. Um, the things that jumped into my head, but all right, I'm going to have to start speeding up because I see we're stacking up questions. Um, yeah, I'm willing to compromise most to be troll straight down fishing. Okay. Um, your video on new boats was excellent. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, it was one of those things that I remember when I first started selling boats. So I started selling boats and I, I, I had this picture in my head that it was like cars, right? Like, you know, you deliver a boat and the boat's perfect. I started in August, uh, August of 2009. And that was right after the, re the, the recession was, we were just coming out of it, right? There was a huge backlog of boats. So we had huge rebates. Um, I had 2007s that were available to me to sell when I started selling. And I remember discounting this boat to below cost right? So we sold it below cost because they just wanted to, they just wanted to get inventory gone. Um, that first fall that I was working. And, um, I remember my manager saying, now you need to let him know that th the boat's gonna, the seats might be dirty. Something might be broken. Um, you know, this is a two-year-old boat and he's getting a great deal. And if he wants it, he needs to know that we're not fixing anything on it for him at that price. And now it just blew me away that that was the mentality. And this was, I did research before I started in the industry. I had my own mortgage company before then, um, had a successful career in finance. And I just, the, the mortgage crisis got me personally. Um, I, I ended up closing down my mortgage company and, and basically starting over from scratch. And I was like, I want to do something that I enjoy. But I was like, that's not how I, I do business. Um, but they were the best dealer. And uh, like, I was surprised with the, I, I learned very early on talking to others in the industry, like every single boat that comes in, this was a quote from a guy at a different dealership that I, I talked to before I started. He said, you need to realize that every single boat that gets delivered to a dealer has issues there. It may just be a couple, but the better dealers address them up front before the customer ever sees the boat, the cheaper, the dealers that sell on price and that don't have great customer service, they deliver the boat and they expect the customer to find all those issues. And then they may or may not fix it depending on what it is. Um, because they don't get, they also, a lot of manufacturers don't play, don't pay full shop rate on warranty work. And for some, it's based on your customer service. They set that shop rate based on your, your CSI levels that you get um, on delivered boats the previous year. And, and it like it floored me that everybody didn't get a perfect boat. 
and that's just was common. So that's where that video idea came from was, was experience and having to, having to teach my customers that like, this is the way it's going to work. I want you to have a great experience, but I want you to know what you're getting into. Um, and then I also would do things on my own to try to deliver a, a perfect, as perfect of a boat as I could get. Um, because that was customer service was the most important thing to me. Um, <laughs> Zebco, um, that's, that's, I remember using that when I was a kid, um, custom built rods since I was in high school, kind of that's, and that's how you win. That's two eleven. If you want to win the tournaments, follow whatever Brock tells you. That's going to put you in the money and thirty years of experience fishing. But that that comes by time. Uh, love the siphon video. It's great. No battery power. No, but yeah, I the guy gave me one. Like I did the video. I did all those videos just for free because I was like, hey, I think this is cool. I think my subscribers would enjoy it. And um, so I did that video. He's like, here, here you go. He's like, you got one of these? I'm like, I don't know. I don't. Um, he's like, here, take it. This is great. But, um, it, yeah, it's such a simple idea and it works so well that, um, I was like, damn, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, okay. So two stroke. All right, Kelly, I got to go back. Um, I got to go back to your original question. I forgot. I can usually keep up in my mind, which, which questions we're, we're chatting about, um gar okay so the uh uh oh five da, 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 two stroke i don't know uh in that in that age range not all of them mercury 200 horsepower that may not have um well yeah if, if it was the if it was the efi if it's fuel injected that it should it should have a code that you can pull um and i i think you'll be okay two stroke it, it could have been um it, it's it's sensed it very well could have been it, it sensed. Um, let's see if this is, uh, this is the same. My mind goes to, was it detecting not enough oil? Um, was it detecting that the, your, if it was injected, that it wasn't injecting oil or wasn't injecting the right level of oil, or it was a sensor that failed that was showing it was it was getting the oil and it was fine but the sensor was bad and it was reading incorrectly so that that on the two stroke that kind of jumps to mind um for me all right let's see here holy smokes i'm getting way behind um ba -ba -ba. all right i just saw constant all right let's see here Got to keep working at it. Um, RPS been looking at some yachts with the Volvo and IPS. Yeah, the the IPS they are um, their their joystick control system um, is good, and um, you know it's there's some people that say, oh, you know that's cheating. It's like it's another tool that makes operating a boat easier. And when you run one, I have not run an IPS. I've run the, um, I've run the Zeus and the Axios. Um, Zeus is Mercury's on the stern drive. Axios is, um, is on their uh, pod drives that they have. I've run both of those systems. It's the same concept. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Volvo's works very, very similar. Um, I mean, you can, you really can put the boat exactly where you want it. Wind, current um you've got you've got outstanding control of I, I the biggest one i ran it on i think was a 58 uh a 58 c ray dancer and um when i was down in charleston and it's i mean it, it, you don't you don't really need to have any prior knowledge because it just it's intuitive i move it sideways the boat moves sideways i spin it the boat spins what you need to know you need to be able to 
have good depth perception. You need to know where your boat is at all times. And the bigger the yacht, the harder it can be to see some of the back corners and um, and see exactly where you are. Getting that depth perception, understanding the size of your boat, um, how it's going to catch wind, what you need to do. Um, that that's probably the the biggest learning. But the running the joystick is is simple. Um, yeah, that's Brian. That's exactly right. Those are those are things. Again, you start checking for as you get to know your boat. You you hear the you sound. What's it? What does it sound like? How does it feel? Um, is it peeing? All of those things will give you some indications that, all right, maybe I can, oh, it's not peeing. Let me check, make sure the, the intakes aren't clogged up. Maybe I need a new impeller. Maybe it's overheating. Let me check the temp gauge or, or if you don't have a temp gauge, a little infrared gun and, um, and check that. All of those things. Um, have I heard transmission issues on the IPS? I, I don't. I, I haven't heard of any. Um, what what year? But that is not Volvo IPS issues. Trans the. <sighs> I haven't heard of any personally RPS. I, I, as I Google it, you know, you Google IPS transmission issues. And of course, all the transmission issues come up that people put in the chat. How many of them are like real issues versus poor maintenance issues, which is very common in boating that something is a common mistake that boaters make which then causes a problem to then come up and, and you have to really read through all the comments. So RPS, I would do that search and, um, and do a double check. It also make sure you're checking the year. So make sure you're paying attention to the year range that you're looking at. If it's brand new, um, you know, look for when they made the, the biggest upgrade or update to the technology, to any of the components and um, and search in that because there's there's a couple of things that can lead you down a negative path that might not necessarily necessarily be um, the IPS system could be user error user maintenance issues more likely um, and if you're going used you need to be aware of that and find out how to check for it you know maybe sending off the sending off the fluid to get um, to get tested but. Um, yeah, it's I don't I don't know of any personally constant audible alarm. OK, yeah. So that tells me that it very likely could be um, it could be that overheating. I think that was the that was one of the constant alarms. And, you know, in 05, depending on when the impeller was changed, depending on how it's been run, um, if you saw the peeing, if you saw it peeing out water, but any of those now you've got the audible alarm. So you narrowed it down to all to, all right, it's these five things. Now I can start checking it, take it back to the water, start it up. Does it come on again? If it does check it, is it peeing? If it's not peeing impeller change, uh, first thing. And that'll get you there. Um, sometimes that constant alarms from the rev limiter malfunctioning, um, did that one time took me ever to figure it out. Interesting. I have not heard that one, Brock. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, when, when you start having sensors go out and things like that, those can be those can be very um, difficult to identify. But again, oftentimes if you can hook it up to that computer, pull the fault codes, that will help zero in. And in '95, they you probably didn't have fault codes back then. It was that's with the with the fuel injected. Now you now you've got to have that ECM. That ECM houses the um, the data and it can store it there. But carbureted, it's all mechanical, so they they didn't have those on there. Um, so I'm hoping that your 05, you can pull that code and you can zero in on it. Um, but that's a very interesting. That's that's another thing. 
um, I think I talked about this on one video. When you go to a technician with a with an issue, the things that you want to tell them are, this is what happened before, this is what happened during, and this is what happened after. So I was running at 5,000 RPMs, was running fine. And this, I would, I'd been running all day. I was running the boat hard. I turned it off. Um, we anchored out for 20 minutes. I cranked it back up and then we went 5,000 RPM and the alarm sounded like all that stuff before. This is what RPM I was at. This is what it sounded like. This is what was happening when the alarm went off. This is what happened when I came back or when it went into limp mode. I checked, was it peeing? And so you give them all those details and with all that, they can, they can start zeroing in more, um, on, on what to look for. Uh, or, you know, you can start doing your Google search and, um, and talking to other boaters, you know, things like what Brock just said, having conversations with other boaters and, and, you know, you gotta be cautious of, of Facebook mechanics, but has anybody had this issue? And then you got to sort through the, you know, 100, 100 comments, 95 of them are don't mean anything, but five of them might have some good information that could be helpful for you in, in diagnosing it. Um, can't beat fly fishing for trout, Bitterroot River in Montana. That's I would love to do um, uh, some some fly fishing in Montana. I've got a buddy that goes up there every year and uh, takes clients up there to uh, uh, some, he belongs to some club uh, that they have land up there. He says it's just beautiful. Um, no, it won't. I was up on plane, pushed the throttle to max, and immediately went to guardian mode. Yeah, so I would check check those things, um, and uh, go go back to that. Well, let's see. Continuous beep, engine overheat, low oil pressure, battery voltage, less than ten volts could be as simple as a battery issue, coolant sensor failure engine speed limiter so that's exceeding that's the rev limiter issue that uh that brock was talking about um but that continuous beat puts you in looking at those uh let me if you can see those right there if you want to if you want to take a screenshot but um that is one of those items is, is likely what it is. And that is, let's see here. P E R F pro tech.com is the blog where that's from. Smart craft. Now that's smart craft. That might be a little different than yours, but they usually use similar, uh, similar alarms. Yeah, that's the, all of the, what was it doing before, during, and after all of that information it helps diagnose. And the, you know, like I said, you put it on Facebook, there are 95 people that take it to a whole nother direction then you know they don't read the comment they don't know anything about boats but they make their comment but there's there's people like brock out there that have had boats for 40 years they've seen issues and um the more details you can give the more likely that you'll get some good information um coming perfectly until it went full throttle yeah that uh, overheating or even the battery um a, a low battery would do it must be saint to the <laughs> oh bo we're kidding all in good fun uh i would yeah bo bo uh likes to give me hell in the comments too that's always fun to go back and forth um i would definitely check out the rev linear module might do the same exact thing six thousand sudden drop to 4800 and not go above Boat lifts. If you have a boat in the water, would you recommend? Yes. So Matt, I, I told you the story about my buddy James and a chaparral. And I, you know, I don't know if you're a, a freshwater guy or saltwater guy, it, it can be different. It can be harder to get the lifts, um, in some areas in salt, depending on where you're at. Um, 
But if you have the opportunity to give a lift, if that's available to you, I think it's money well spent because again, you know, you're on a, let's say a 20, well, but if you're going after, if you're doing a pontoon, then it's different. I'm talking fiberglass boats because fiberglass can blister. Um, there's just, there's more things that can be an issue with fiberglass. Um, and, and if you paint a fiberglass boat, it, it depreciates, it decreases the value. Now, if you put a pontoon in the water and you leave it in the water and you lift, you've got an outboard, you lift it all the way up. Now I'm okay with that. It, it'll, it'll look better if it's on a lift, it'll be more protected, but it's not as significant as when you're looking at a fiberglass boat. And here's why is because the aluminum, the aluminum is going to get kind of, you know, these guys that spend hours and hours shining up their tunes after two months, they're going to be dingy again. It's just, it's the nature of, of aluminum in that environment. Um, but if you leave it in the a pontoon in the water, it's fine. What's going to happen is you're going to get growth on the bottom of the tunes. You pull it out, you know, once if you're in a warm climate, like down here in the South, I would pull it out probably 4th of July timeframe. And that would pull it out maybe mid early to mid August, because that growth is going to happen as the water warms up, it's going to accelerate. So as your water temperature goes up, the level of growth on those tunes gets more and more. So in April, May, June, July, you're not going to get or April, May into June. You're not going to get much growth, but in June, towards the end of June, as that water temperature starts going up, now that growth starts. So you leave it in early July, you pull it, you power wash it, and now you're good to go. Maybe you put some, um, you put some tomb bright on it or something like that. Um, it cl cleans them up a little bit, make, gives them a little bit of shine, but it's real easy and simple to do. Put it back in the water. If it's a warm enough climate that you're going to get growth again, fine. Pull it mid August, pressure wash them again and, uh, drop it back in and you're good to go. If you're in salt, if you're in salt, now you do need to, you do need to, um, paint the tunes. If you're going to leave it in the water and salt again. If you have the option in salt, I would put a pontoon on a lift if I could. You got to be cautious though, again, because that salt, if you're on a lift, you've got to make sure that that salt is not just like, you know, carpeted bunks, because now you've got that salt water. You're just letting it sit and corrode and corrode and corrode and you'll have issues. But if you leave it in the water, now you've got to paint it. Cause again, that salt is going to cause some serious havoc on that aluminum, you get pitting and eventually you get some pinholes in it. If you leave it in too long, there you paint it. You got to make sure they're using the right paint because if it has any um, uh, copper in it, it's going to leave little pinholes in your tubes and that's going to be a disaster. So you got to use the right paint. You got to prep it really, really good, right temperatures. Um, you got to clean them real good and, and do the prep part. Like any painting, you got to do that prep part right and uh, do it probably every two years, um, maybe even every year, depending on where you're at. So there, there were some different scenarios in there, Matt. If you've got, if you want to give me your specific one, I'll, I'll give you a little bit uh, more thought there. Kelly, I built the lake that's fairly shallow, sand bottom, lots of grass, 200, go back and forth a few times, cleans it. Yeah, that, that, um, if it was sucking stuff up, that happens a lot, uh, rays in Indiana happens a lot in, in Minnesota where they've got a lot of, a lot of grass, a lot of weeds in the, in the, um, in the water. Um, yeah, the, the rev limiter is going to be, um, probably, I don't know if it's a sensor, but re you got to replace something. I don't, there's no resetting it. It's, it's faulted. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, not working properly. So it'd be, it would be replacing the probably something in the computer. Uh, I would guess. I couldn't, my 95 had a yeah new rev module for it. Um, right next to the CDI box. I can tell we're getting towards spring boating season, more people <laughs> attending the lot. Yeah. 27. I see right now. Oh, 25. Uh, I just dropped a couple people off. Uh, it's, I try not to watch too closely to how many are on. 
uh, but I do like to glance every now and again. And uh, yeah, I can see, I was looking at this. Um, I'll show you my, my back end a little bit. I always get nervous in the, So you can see over the over the last ninety days, the um, the trend for views. It's you know Thanksgiving when people are on holiday, they go up a little bit. Around December's down, 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 down. Boat show season hits in early January, and we start going up, and um, we should be continuing to head up um, as we as we get through the the warm weather throughout the country. So, um, savvy symbolic, good to have you. Welcome. Stephen, good to have you back. Uh, warm winter. There's ice <laughs> right now. Iced out. Boat in. Um, that is good. Whatever happened to Evan Rude? They they killed it. Um, BRP um, Bombardier that builds uh, the Sea Dews. They bought Evan Rude. They bought the brand. Um, they ran it for a while. They built the G2, which was the most technically advanced two-stroke, cleanest burning engines. Nobody wanted them. They were, I say nobody wanted them. There's a group of avid lovers like Bo. It, it, there's, hey, you. if I make a video saying anything bad about Evan Rude, I get a group of guys that will attack me for being an idiot, not knowing anything um, about boats. But... The bottom line is that they couldn't get their engines on the on the back of of boats. Even the boat brands that they had, Manitou and Aluma uh, Luma Craft, and uh, what was the third one? They've got another one that's overseas, but those boats didn't sell well because they only had Evan Roods, and a lot of people didn't want them. They were they were so technically advanced that they were real touchy real hard to work on them unless you were a, a expert um, Evan Rude tech and they had their no service for 300 hours. Well, yeah, but you, there's still things that need to be paid attention to. Uh, and, and so just things didn't go well. Mercury had come out with the 600. Um, Yamaha had come out with the 425 and they, they just, they weren't able to go bigger in horsepower. That's the direction things were going. Nobody was interested in two, two, two strokes. So during the pandemic was everything was kind of going crazy. They shut the brand down and said, all right, we've got this new ghost project coming out. And they put all of their resources from the Evan Rude outboard into this ghost project, which turned out to be a new outboard a Rotax outboard that is, in my opinion, going to be a bust. It's going it, to, as a matter of fact, my father-in-law is a financial planner. And I was like, you should, might want to look at shorting um, BRP because I think this is going to be a disaster in the making. Uh, and this is just from seeing the, seeing the images of what they did. So... This is the Rotax outboard, and I, I think we've talked about it here before, but they did it so that it could be an outboard and have a full swim platform, the biggest issue with an outboard motor. But the problem is, if you can see this image right here, the block is submerged underwater. So if there's any failure in this over time, that block is wet, and that's never good. Um, I just... I, I haven't talked to a dealer that was super excited about it. Matter of fact, I've talked to one dealer that was a pretty big dealer for one of their boat brands and they dropped it after that dealer meeting. Cause they're like, we don't like the direction that they're taking the boats, the looks of it and the um, pushing these, these new motors. We don't think they're going to, we don't think they're going to be good for our customers and they are looking to pick up a different brand. So that's what happened to Evan Rude. And unfortunately, great brand with great history is now gone. And um, I don't know, they, they could sell the brand and somebody could bring them back. But, it, you know, you've got, 
Yamaha, Mercury, and Suzuki is making a huge push. I saw at the at the boat show, there was a ton of Suzuki's. So they must be putting a lot of money into dealers' pockets for um what what manufact what engine manufacturers will do is they will co-op their boat show investment based on going exclusive that brand of motor at the show. So Suzuki will say, listen, we'll we'll give you, we'll reimburse you five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars of your show expense if you only have Suzuki outboards or only have Mercury outboards or only have Yamaha outboards. So that's what I noticed was there are three or four dealers that were exclusively Suzuki. And that tells me that Suzuki saying, Hey, we want to, we're trying to grow our market share right now. We came out of the pandemic and we grew, we're going to try to get on some transoms. They're already doing great in repower market uh, because they're, you know, 10, 15% cheaper than Yamaha or Mercs. And um, you know, they're for all indications, they're just as reliable, just as capable of engines as Yamaha and Merck. And, And so if, if Evan Roos to try to come in, they're they're really behind the eight ball. There's three well established players. You still have Honda. You have Tahatsu trying to make a run. And um, if Evan Ruder get back in, they would be number six. I think that's a, a tough row to hoe. Uh, you have to go to the 350 now in Yamas to get the V8. 300 is a V. Okay, interesting. Um, I've got a. Yeah, I need to I need to make that video. One, I need to do it just for myself so I I'm back up to date the um on on where those brakes are gary what did you say what did you say that autocorrect got you getting towards <laughs> the yeah type it on the phone can be can be different di- different di- difficult difficult um it was peeing. Okay, good. All right. So Kelly, I, th- I think you should be zeroing in on, on what the issue is. And, um, and that should, that should help you as, as, so you can talk, you can do a little bit more digging on the internet. Um, and then if you're a tech guy, um, if you're a tech person, you can start digging in yourself and, and start zeroing in on what it is based on taking it to the lake, uh, or again, getting it hooked up to a computer and, and zeroing in even faster. Um, Black Max series, kind of a Mercury. Um, I re- yeah, I remember my uncle's boat, my uncle Bob. Um, he oh, it was probably a 1980 Johnson um, that uh, he had. We were on vacation with him one year, and it went into limp mode. It was the whole the at that point it was the the ECM went out, and so our the power. I guess they called it the power pack. I don't know what that was for sure. But um, it very well could have been something similar to that. But replaced it and back in business. It was just that one little part. Do you know common issues with bass trackers? Um, and thank you, uh, Jungaran. Um, Tell me a little bit more when you say common issues with bass trackers. Um, are, are you talking what engine, what size, what year? Give me a little bit more. Um, they're, you know, they are, let's see here. I'm going to pull this up here, but you know, you, you gotta be the, the problem with videos there. I, I do the same thing. They are a little bit, um, they are a little bit, uh, clickbaity. So you gotta be careful to, you know, like somebody like, uh, go downsize. This is an RVing channel that is, is into, they'll, they'll put some content out on boating, but you can tell they don't really know what they're talking about. They're welded together, not riveted. Um, thought that well, it seems are stronger, did not leak. You can just tell that they're, it's somebody that doesn't know boats very well. Um, but you might get some info from it. Here's, here's my initial thought as you give me some more info is they're a value brand. Okay. So the, the tracker brand, the bass tracker 
is a is a value brand. So they're not using as thick a gauge of aluminum. Um, they are they're keeping that price down by reducing the quality and the amount of material that they use. Um, so the upholstery on the on the seats is a, a thinner mills than you know a, a more premium. Uh, aluminum bass boat, like a Lund or, or something like that. Um, but with that, so th- that kind of goes for everything. The, um, the pumps, the wiring is, you know, they, they might not heat shrink everything and, and seal it up. They might not have their connectors that are, are weatherproof. Um, and, and there can be electrical issues, things like that. On the other hand, they're powered with the mercury. You know, they're, they're powered with the same power plant that many, many premium brands and, you know, in, including Lund, Low, Crestliner, all of the, all of the Brunswick product that owns Mercury. So it, it is a matter of what specific issue. And I'm going to, I'm going to scroll down, um, seen life move around. I've seen life move around on the algae on my bass tracker. Um, have a rough st- um, share share your story. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're right. It's because they because they wanted to call it an outboard uh, and it's a two stroke as well. It's a two stroke. So they're, I don't know. I don't know what they had going on. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to follow your, your train here and I'll Kevin, I'm going to come back up to you as well. Um, Kevin C. So I bought this Brax Checker classic XL new for the first year ran perfectly had to do halfway into the summer. It wouldn't stay running. Wouldn't start, stopped immediately, chewed through sensors, ate three of them, chewed through sensors, ate three of them, mechanics claim to have fixed it under warranty, but the problem still persisted. The following summer, it was all year, became clear, mechanics could not replicate the issue I was having. Took another mechanic, they figured it out, waited a few months for the part, starter, for the key was stuck. Yeah. So that's, that's the type of situation I'm going to, I'm going to take a guess. This may not be true, but, um, the, the technicians at a Bass Pro Shop or a Cabela's are typically not always, there are some great ones out there. Um, but typically not as knowledgeable and experienced in diagnosing issues that you would find at at a mobile a, a mobile technician or at a dealership that's a Mercury certified, because they don't pay as well, um, and, and just by the nature of their of their business, um, did not okay all right, so that that can happen at the Bass Pro, but the other thing is, like I said, because it's a because it's a more value boat, um, they can they can do some things in the wiring that can cause issues. I don't know if there was some wiring issue that may have impacted the starter um, or if it was just that mercury had a, had a starter issue. Uh, But that either way doesn't make it any better. It sounds like you had a shit experience (laughs) regardless. And, um, and, uh, but no, I, I haven't heard, I haven't heard that particular issue with any of the bass trackers. Um, it, but it is when you have less quality wiring, those types of things are more prone to happen. Um, and when you get to electrical issues, things like starters, like, you know, like Brock was saying, the, the sensor went out when you have things like that, that can be really hard to diagnose and to figure them out. Um, and it takes, that's why finding a good technician can be valuable because things like that can even come up on a brand new boat with warranty. And, um, you know, I don't know where you're at in the situation, but if you try to get on the phone with a, with a rep at Mercury 
and uh, go directly to Mercury. Maybe you, there's there's something that can be done to uh, to improve the situation. Uh, but I, I don't know enough about who you're working with, who you've talked to. But um, it's at times there can be value in I'm not getting what I need from the dealer and jumping to the manufacturer directly to the engine manufacturer um, in, in that case or, or to the boat manufacturer if it's a, a boat side issue, um, which it sounds like this is definitely a, a motor side issue. See if it's getting oil, take the cap off the container, the engine running, see if there's suction. Um, <laughs> yeah. Trusting, trusting those, uh, um, trusting the automatic injection can be, there's a lot of people that, st that go disconnect that and mix their gas so that they don't have to worry about it. Cause that can be devastating. Uh, Captain Matt bought the same color paint for my boat manufacturer to paint over chip paint on the hull of my aluminum boat. Anything I need to be aware of Kevin, unfortunately, I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about prepping and painting aluminum other than this just generic advice is take your time on the prep. The, the prep is where the, the long lasting quality will be. It's that's the part of it that most people go too quickly and they don't follow the very, very specific steps and detail to prep that surface like they need to um, can cause, you know, premature peeling and, and just a poor end result. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have any um, I don't have any advice for you on that, Kevin. So you, you waited all that time for nothing for a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> um, I, I wish I, I wish I had, um, let's see who does, you know what? There's somebody that has done a, a video on painting an aluminum boat. Who was that? Uh, let's see if I can. Aluminum crest liner start to finish. All right. I'm not, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing the one that I was thinking of, but it looks like this one right here. Painting aluminum boat with spray paint and primer, smoker craft restoration, that one might be okay, but boat painting application on aluminum crust liner start to finish. Great Escape Marine and Tiny Boat Nation. I would I would check those two. But that's not the one that um ah, that's not the one that I saw that was that I thought was really good. Um rolling and tipping do's and don'ts of painting your boat. Was it tiny boat nation? Let me see if it was this guy. That doesn't seem like it. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if it was him or not, but um, I would check those two out and um, they might have, They'll they'll definitely have some better information for you than just prep it really well, um, but but don't skip don't don't uh, skimp on the prepping. Just to premix the oil with the gas to run mine a little richer because I was spending the hell out of it. <laughs> the adjustable rev limiter I had it tuned up to seventy four hundred. Used to get right to ninety miles an hour out of my old. <laughs> that is cruising. That is cruising. Uh, Sadly, I melted a piston, tossed a rod out the cylinder five years ago, uh, or three years ago. Awesome motor, uh, thousands of tournaments as well as <laughs> that you can run them. You can run them hard, but at some point it'll catch up with you. Um, all right, so yeah, Lake in, a lake in Wisconsin. So for for your purposes, you can probably get away. Matt with just power pulling it in late July, 
um, when that grow, you'll, you'll notice your, your miles per hour start to drop. Um, so why is pontoon slow? So I did this video, um, a couple years ago, seven reasons your pontoon is slow. You will notice, you will notice your speed drop off five, seven miles an hour in some cases. And when you, when you start feeling your performance dropping, um, just, you know, run your hand along the bottom and you'll feel, you'll feel that growth. It doesn't take a lot for it to start impacting your speed, which would mean you're burning more fuel than you need to have the boat hauled. Um, and, uh, it, it's easiest. It's easiest if you can take it to a marina where they can lift it with a forklift, lift it up high and power wash it. They might charge you a little bit for it. Um, but, uh, that's the easiest way to do it. Otherwise, if you get it on the trailer, um, now you, you've got to sort of get it the best you can. And, um, and you can't, because it's sitting in the bunks, you can't always get everywhere that you want, but, um, but if you can get it on a hoist somewhere, that's going to be it, it, on a forklift is super easy. If you take it to somewhere where they can hook it on all four corners and lift it up off the trailer and then hit it, that's, that's great too. Um, and, uh, but they also, they make these brushes. I've never used them. Um, pontoon. Gosh, I don't know if that's going to get me what I want. Um, pontoon cleaning brush. Here we go. So this guy came up with this, um, pontoon cleaner. If you, let me go big on that, you can see it's like a U and he's got it on these poles. And so you, while it's in the water, you just take that and you, you brush back and forth. It, if you've got lifting strakes, it doesn't, it doesn't do a great job getting around those strakes because of the, um, because of the U shape of it. It's just, it's not that precise that it's going to be able to get that, but it'll do a, it'll do a really good job for you. I don't remember how much these things were, but he sells them direct 300 bucks. So, uh, that may be, um, and he's, he's from here in, in, uh, North Carolina, um, up on Lake Norman, which is, which is one of the lakes I boat on. But the tune-up brush is what it's called, tuneupbrush.com, and you can you can check him out. I think he's still doing it. This last was updated 2018. Um, if I remember right, I, I talked to him one year. Is This was just kind of a side project for him. And um, so you can, you can check out to see if he's still – if he's still offering those trying to be proactive to avoid any issues from starting because a couple tiny missing paint spots that chipped off on the hull. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, check out those videos. I think that's going to be the, the best way to go. And, uh, you'll, you'll get some info. Yeah. So Matt on your chaparral, I, I 100% would say get a lift. Uh, I think you'll be, because here, here's the thing that happens if you, if you leave that, um, SSI on the water and I don't know if it's a stern drive or a, or a outboard, but if it's a stern drive, you get one little hole in your, in your bellows, um, and your boat's going to sink. And, and if it's a second home for you, if it's not your primary residence and you leave that boat sitting there for a, a week at a time, you know, it, it can go down within a day or two. Um, and, and down here in South Carolina, we've got uh, muskrats and the muskrats will chew on anything rubber. So we, if you leave your drive up, um, the muskrats will come in there and they'll chew it up and they'll they'll sink a boat in a hurry. It happens all the time down here. I don't know if you've got critters up there that would that would do that. Um, but if you do, um, and you, you leave your boat in the water overnight ever, make sure you leave that drive all the way down. So it limits their access to, to get to some of those, um, the shift cable bellows specifically. Rough story about my bass tracker. All right. We got that. Um, 
<laughs> tomorrow will be six weeks. Um, anytime. Well, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, two 11, I'm hoping that next Sunday that, uh, we are hearing about, uh, your first, your first outing, um, on your, uh, on your C pro. So that'll be awesome. Love this channel. Uh, learned as much new boner from watching your channel and live streams. Thanks so much for booing the community. You're very welcome, Kevin. I, uh, I appreciate, I appreciate that comment for sure. And, um, and I say this all the time, but I appreciate you guys support, you know, watching, giving the thumbs up, sharing videos, investing in my programs, uh, just asking questions on this live stream is, is, uh, fun for me. Um, best boat captain in the water is a must for new boaters. Uh, no experience how to fully control your boat worth every penny. Uh, awesome. I love, I really, really love to hear that. I am, I am super proud of those programs and, uh, for anybody watching. That's the best boat captain on the water program. And then we've got trailer like a pro confident coastal boater tow water sports with confidence uh, as well. And they all come with the money back guarantee. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm super proud of those. And I, I, I can't get enough comments and emails like that. It, um, it, it really, really makes me smile. Um, really, really makes me smile. I, you know what? I, I think they should just call that uh, an, an IO. Uh, but it's, it's really not, it's, everything's housed, everything's housed in the, it is truly an outboard. It's, there's nothing inside the boat, but, um, I don't know. I, I think that, I think in five years from now, we're going to hear some just disastrous stories that, um, are unlike your, unlike your bass tracker story, it's going to be, a pand uh, epidemic of, of problems with those engines. Um, after they, you know, they're going to be great until somebody opens them up and then those seals, they no, they're just don't go back to way they, to the way they should. And over time, it's just too rough of an environment. Uh, any problem with trickle charging a cranking battery or storage, turning the power switch off, storing my boat and garage, didn't want to go through the trouble. Um, no, you're fine. Just make sure you've got a smart charger that's going to turn off when the, when it's not going to cook the battery. Make sure that um, it's uh, when it gets fully charged, it's going to sense it and it's going to turn off, and um, and you'll be you'll be in good shape. Depending on where you keep it, um, depending on where you keep it, if you have it at a marina, some marinas will not allow it because there's if you don't have the right setup um, or it fails, which has happened before. But, um, it's, it's not common in the, it's usually older technology, but, um, you should be okay with that. If it's in your garage or if it's in somewhere you control. Um, all right. The knocking point too funny. That's the talk is about rev limiter limp mode. My boat 330 Suzuki, uh, attached to my truck on its way. <laughs> Mine will go over 3000 RPM. Yeah. There's, like I said, you, you start telling your issues and there's somebody else in the boating community that's had something similar or is going through it right now. So, um, knocking point, welcome, welcome to the live. I've not seen your name before and, um, uh, it's great to, great to have you join us here. All right. Let's see here. Sustainability. Complaining about side thrusters is like old powder boats laughing at the first power boats. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, I hey, whatever, whatever you enjoy. If if you want to be, if you want to be the guy with the with the 1958 um, you know, Johnson, Evan Rude, and, and you want that on a on an old boat that's got the pole lever steering and uh, the pulleys and the, you know, if that's what you enjoy great do it you like tinkering if you want to have the autonomous driving boat when they get that figured out that you need to sit back and you don't have to do you don't need my docking program you don't need the best boat captain you don't need to have any skill but you get to the dock and you tell it what to do and you just sit back and relax or anywhere in between go out and do it as long as you're having fun as long as you're not imposing on anybody else having fun you're being respectful and courteous and all that knock it out, go have fun on the water because it's, it's awesome. However you choose to do it. Um, but there's always, you know, everybody's got their, their way that they think it should be done. And, um, 
it's oftentimes old salty guys that have been around boats and they've, they've learned it the hard way and everybody needs to, to have the skills. Otherwise they're, you know, they're, uh, they're not doing it right. Um, talk to another mechanic. They replicated as well. Um, took a few weeks. Yeah. That can be when there's that intermittent issues, intermittent issues, usually are electrical. A lot of times are electrical and they can be big problems. Went with the tracker boat knowing I would need to potentially upgrade some things. Uh, yeah. The, the great local dealer is, is key, key, key. And, um, and, you know, knowing, knowing that's what you're, that's what you're getting. Brian's had two great, I think two now, two great seasons on his uh, sun tracker pontoon. And he's like, Hey, I, I just, I didn't want to spend that extra money. I, I knew I'm in West Virginia. We're only going to boat four months out of the year, maybe. Um, and this is going to suit me perfectly. It, it fits my budget. It fits the way we're going to use it. And um, and he's going to have a great time with it. Ten years from now, if he if he keeps the boat up like I know he will, that boat's still going to be giving him a great time out of the water with him and his grandkids. And um, that's that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. But try to avoid these types of issues like uh, Jungaran got into. Um, couldn't take it to a Bass Tracker place, didn't have the means to move it, had to pay for the part, hoping it's fixed now, too late in the season to do anything when I get it back. Top of all that, sent Bass Tracker an email, explaining the whole thing. The response they gave me was so generic, it was <laughs> physically hurt. Uh, Merck, the part, oh, the part was Bass Tracker. Okay, yep, so... That's that's interesting that the starter was a bass tracker product. That's very interesting. Um, ah, it was the ignition switch on the gas. So it was essentially an electrical issue. They used a cheaper switch. It wasn't didn't get wired properly, or or maybe there was a there was a short in it, something like that. And um, yeah, that you know a hundred hundred and fifty dollar part whole boat doesn't run. Um, those are, that, that is frustrating. And, uh, but I'm glad you got it fixed out so that you can, you can get on the water and you just said too late in the season. I don't know if you are, are in the, in the Southern hemisphere, or if you're talking this, this all happened last year and now you're, now you're getting back at it. Um, all right, Corey, great to have you. Thanks for stopping by. We are, oh shit, we're an hour and 40 minutes. Um, so we'll, if you got any last questions, throw them in there. Otherwise, um, otherwise we will start wrapping up here. I'll get through the last ones that are there. Saw a tournament fish way in this past weekend in Orange Lake, Florida. Must have been 30 plus bass boats parked at the ramp. How these tournaments play out during the weekend. They usually, um, Savvy Symbol, they usually will run them during the week. Um, so around here, Thursday is, is bass fishing weekend. Um, but when they do have them on the weekend, they're out early in the morning, typically. Uh, and they come back, you know, they come back at a time where it's chaos. You know, it, the, the takeoff is usually early in the morning, but, um, you know, the weigh in and all that there's, you know, you got 30 boats getting back to the ramp all at the same time for a weigh in. And they want to get there, especially if they haven't caught anything real big, they want to get their last extra casts in and then they haul ass down the lake um, it, it just, it turns into chaos for 45 minutes. Everybody gets loaded up. They do their way in. Um, and then it's, it's back to normal, but, um, but around here anyway, they, they typically do it, um, do it on a, a Thursday is, is, um, on Lake Wiley. Get those brushes. You can tax power drill. <laughs> yes. That, uh, that is the way to do it. Just jump in the lake every cup. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Handheld, scrub it off. Um, <clears throat> I am, I'm just outside of Charlotte. So the research triangle is about three, three and a half hours away. Um, but, um, I'm, I'm 20 minutes to downtown Charlotte. I'm, I'm actually in South Carolina. Um, but it's only 20 minutes to get to, to downtown, um, to the downtown Charlotte area. So it's about three and a half hours away up to Raleigh, Durham area. Not knocking point. The knocking point. You're very welcome. Uh, glad to have you. Took a job with the new company. We have an office there. We'll be visiting from time to time. Uh, yeah, it's it's a ways away. But uh, if you do ever make it down to Charlotte, that is um, 
that is me. <laughs> Brock getting caught with the autocorrect uh, usually has 50 boats, 50 ish boats on the water every other weekend. Blast off at first light, weigh in three, four. Yeah. I usually that's what I was thinking in the afternoon, but the, the dropping all the boats in before anybody else is up and on the water. Um, but, uh, it, you know, again, you get 30, 50 boats coming back all at the same time. They're, uh, they are, but they're one thing I'll say about bass boat guys is those guys can load up a boat quick. In most cases, I, I'm sure Brock knows of a handful of them that, uh, could use trailer like a pro, but for the most part, those bass guys, they, they do it so often. And a lot of them do it by themselves that they've got a system down and they are, uh, they are Johnny on the spot. So, all right, guys, we are hour 40 minutes in. I appreciate you uh, joining us. I appreciate all the questions, the the great feedback. Um, I appreciate um, Brock and, and everybody sharing their experience and their knowledge with the community. Um, uh, questions that I just didn't have answers to that you guys stepped up and, and helped out with is always appreciated. Um, welcome all you new guys. Thanks for, thanks for being a part of it. We're here virtually every Sunday at eight 30 and uh, we will be back next Sunday. Take care, everybody. Remember life truly is better on a boat. Oh, love your live show. All the great online content. Thanks for all the comments. <laughs> You're very welcome. Kelly, thanks for being here. And, uh, hopefully we'll see you on some more in the future. Take care, everybody.